Got a few more people rolling in, but uh, guys, uh, it's been quite a while since I've been over here doing any kind of lecture, and this is this is new for me. So I hope this all goes well. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, fractures and their management in a primary care office, and I realize, unfortunately, like, like a lot of the fractures don't actually get to you guys during residency. Uh, because it kind of goes from the ER, or urgent cares over to us or somewhere else or to the, you know, to uh, team health. Um, but, you know, I do, I hope at least in the times you get over there with me, that you at least get some exposure and some comfortability to take care of common fractures. I lay out some common fractures that I really think, you know, aren't too complicated to manage and kind of hopefully help you to figure out a line like, like I can take care of this one, but I don't, I don't want to take care of these others. So uh, that's kind of my goal today. Um, I don't know if it's going to take up the entire time, but um, I kind of revamped this talk a little bit. And so we'll, we'll just kind of jump right in. So we'll start out with just some initial general uh, things to think about with fracture care, discuss kind of types of fractures you might come across and then just a quick conclusion at the end. So again, I do believe that Primary care physicians can manage fractures. It's a nice procedure you can add to the things that you do. Uh, as ever, as most of you guys are aware, if you're not aware, unfortunately you get paid more to do something rather than to think, which is unfortunate. And you know, it's uh, in family medicine, a lot of what you're doing is thinking and managing chronic disease and not necessarily doing a procedure. But this is a nice procedure to be able to add to do. The reimbursement is pretty good, whether you paid by RBUs or I, you know what you get uh, paid, but it's a it's a nice thing that you can do. So do as much as you can now while you're in your residency uh, to get comfortable with the management of things. Um, you know, take a look at X-rays, get comfortable reading X-rays, especially when you're in um, All those things I think can be be helpful in, in what you're doing. So, so as fracture types, I mean, you just need to know your terminology and anatomy. So. Um, when you're describing a fracture to somebody, so say you're not quite sure what to do, you got somebody on the phone, you know, fortunately a lot of times these days we can send pictures, we can go on a pack system, everybody can look at it together, which always makes things a lot easier, but there are some certain situations where you're gonna need to, you know, describe it to somebody. You're talking to a surgeon that's scrubbed in surgery or something like that. They wanna know what you're, what you're looking at. So um, you gotta know like with a, a trans difference between a transverse fracture versus oblique versus spir spiral and comminuted, and then in the pediatric population, there's torus, green stick, and the salter hair. So those are also important things to looking at. Um, the torus fracture is a buckle injury, so the cortex is buckled but not broken. Green stick is a you know, uni unicortical injury where the other side remains intact, and salter hairs we'll talk about. And then also you just want to make sure you're describing the angulation amount of displacement, whether there's any kind of rotation or shortening of the bone um, as, you're, as you're looking at it. So when you talk about the parts of a bone, we'll just kind of touch on, a, you know, what's, what are the parts of a long bone? These are the more, more common ones to be broken anyway. You know, the shaft of the bone, you can call it the shaft. You can also call it the diaphysis, which is the more medical term. Uh, between, you know, the ends of the bone are the epiphysis, and that is what makes up the, artic you know, the articular portion of the bone. Between those two is a short segment called the metaphysis. Well, um, surprisingly, a lot of fractures happen to occur at that location, so good, good to know that term as well. And then in pediatrics, you have the physes. Um, those close, obviously, as, as uh, kids, you know, mature and, and, they're, and become fully skeletal mature. Uh, the x-ray there is a evidence of just a kid with open physes. You can see the buccal injury, uh, the location of the, that injury on both bones. Um, I'll ask some of the people here, what would you say, where, where is that buckling um, on that bone? What part of it? Yeah, it's right at the metaphysis, right? So you have a buccal fracture of the distal radial metaphysis. It's more on the you know, dorsal side if you're you know, going to describe it. And then above that is the Salter Harris classification. I, you know, if you spend any time with me, I quiz you guys on this all the time. Um, when you're looking at these injuries that occur around physes, uh, just to go quickly through that, you know, a type one shown there is a, just a separation at the physis. Sometimes that's just a clinical diagnosis. 
brain think, well, it looks kind of normal, but that's exactly where they hurt on the bone. Um, you can always get a comparison view to know for sure that there's some separation. But honestly, even if you don't see some separation, it doesn't mean there couldn't be a fracture through that, through that part. So you know, when you see it, it's definitely different side to side, then you know for sure that, and you can nail down the diagnosis. But that's a type one. A type two goes through the metaphysis and then into the physis itself. And that by far is the most common type that you'll see. Some of that is because it's, you know, type ones are easily like not recognized because it looked just like a normal physis. But type two is most common. And then type three actually goes through the articular surface. So, and then into the physis itself. Type four involve all three. Uh, it involves the epiphysis, the physis, and then the, also the metaphysis. And then a type five is a more of a crushing injury where the two get, uh, where the two ends kind of get compressed together. Um, it's more honestly clinical utility to describe things than anything. Uh, I have seen some things suggesting that the more, the higher the number you get on a, on a Salter-Harris classification, the more likely there is some physeal injury causing early physeal closure at the area of injury. So, um, in general, I, I would, you know, there are, depending on the bone you're dealing with, when you have an injury at the growth plate, especially if it's a weight-bearing long bone, you might consider, you know, follow-up x-rays on that patient three to six months after it seems fully healed, just to check for that bony bridging occurring uh, in your management. So when you're describing angulation, uh, there's kind of two accepted methods of describing it. You can describe it by movement of the distal fracture fragment, um, or you the direction that the apex of the that you're measuring points. So like in this example here, you have a distal radius fracture and the end of it is dorsally angulated. So say you pulled out a, you pulled out your measuring tool on your pack system and you measured that and you found out that, well, that's a 30 degree angle. You'd say, well, there's 30 degrees of dorsal angulation of the distal fracture fragment. Or you could say there's 30 degrees apex volar angulation. Does that make sense to people here? So as you draw that angle, you know, points in a volar direction. So those are kind of the two acceptable ways of describing uh, angulation. Honestly, you know, displacement typically is, is uh, to just describe the two pieces and the, their relationship to one another. So say the distal part is displaced, you know, either radially or ulnarly. You can just say, well, the distal fracture fragments displaced five millimeters in a radial direction or an older direction. Again, you can use the term based on what, where you are anatomically and what bone you're speaking of. So um, again, those are the kind of main things to think about as far as describing the fracture. So good to have a sense too when you're taking care of fractures of how do these things heal? Uh, because it does, you do see things, you do see patterns develop as healing happens, you know, in long bones and, and other bones. But basically initially, as soon as the bone breaks, there's an initial inflammatory phase. There's lots of bleeding that occurs. There's chemotactic factors and signals that start to activate to initiate healing. And, you know, there's, there's importance to that thing, to that process. And so, you know, NSAIDs are used because sometimes it seems like that process, so much swelling, so much, you know, edema that happens and you wanna kind of control that a little bit, but you also don't wanna control it too much because it's important. And so I think we're finding more and more that NSAIDs usage should be tempered in some of these acute injuries because it is important in, in the healing, healing phase of things. Probably the most important and kind of tricky phase of a healing fracture is the granulation tissue formation phase. That starts at about day seven and goes up and lasts for two weeks. So you're talking about weeks one to three. And unfortunately, that's kind of the time when you have this granulation tissue. It's not really solid tissue. And so you have these two bony fragments sitting on each other. And if there's, you have this kind of soft foundation, then sometimes the fracture can settle into that or, or kind of angulate a little bit, even despite having a good cast or splint you know, placed. So that is usually the window of time where things change. So because of that, we like to re-X-ray within a week, sometimes, two, you know, sometimes you might wait two weeks, but certainly weekly x-rays within that first few, few weeks is, a, is an important time to be checking things because that's when things can change. That three-week time, then you start to get uh, cell differentiation and proliferation, pr proliferation of osteoblasts and chondroblasts that kind of change this granulation tissue into this woven meshwork of, of bone that's produced. And so this is when we start to see on an x-ray what we call callus. It's this little fluffy looking calcification that shows up around the edges of the bone, or you 
can see it kind of between the two pieces. And that's when you're starting to get more solid healing. Typically, the patient starts to feel quite a bit better. And that starts at around four weeks. And, and you know, depending on the bone, can take up to 16 weeks. Uh, you know, some bones take longer to heal than others. The final two phases are usually phases we don't really watch much. You know, things are healed well enough. The patient's feeling good. They don't have tenderness. You got, you know, pretty good solid, solid healing. But basically, the lamellar bone replaces this kind of uh, meshwork of bone and it uh, becomes more organized. And then remodeling is the last stage. And that can take, you know, even anywhere from months to years. Uh, again, depending on the age of the patient. And, uh, so factors that can influence healing, uh, age, as you get older, unfortunately, you just don't heal as quickly. Um, other comorbidities that, that, that the patient might have, you know, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, basically things that affect uh, the ability for nutrition and uh, proper things to get there to heal. Uh, certain medication usage, again, we've discussed N said steroids again I rarely just prescribe steroids or use steroids around an area where there's a fracture healing and says I just always there are there are certainly people in my field that were pretty dogmatic about not using it to just preach kind of tempered use of it you don't want to take it scheduled every day throughout the time of fracture healing um, but you just have to decide based on you know, you're, you're looking at things kind of where you fall on that uh, definitely smoking effect affects things the you know, the nutrition that the patient is taking in through their diet. Uh, the type of fractures can affect things as well. Open fra fractures you probably won't take care of. I don't take care of you know, open fractures in general, but open versus closed certainly because of the amount of injury to the tissue around, around the area uh, of the bony injury uh, can be significant in, in their healing and the complications that can occur. Uh, again, same, same thing with degree of trauma when you're talking about you know, motorized vehicle accidents and other things. Uh, neurovascular damage that can occur can make it much more difficult and problematic. Um, and then if you haven't developed any infection or have any uh, local disease, such as skin issues or other things, that can certainly affect uh, the healing. So any questions on any of that stuff so far for those that, okay. So kind of general principles of, you know, how, what am I going to do with this broken bone? Um, I just don't remember this. In general, if you above and below the area of the injury, you're going to be very, that's conservative. You're going to be okay. Nobody's going to question that, you know, and, and as, so err on the side of mobilizing joint above and below. There are times where that's maybe more than you need, but again, a conservative uh, kind of rule to follow. Um, as far as re-x-raying, I would say in general, especially when you're first starting to take care of fractures, x-ray weekly for the first, you know, two to three weeks. Again, you're kind of just watching that window where that grain Simulation tissue developing and things can potentially change. As you take care of more of these and you start to see some of these patterns and you know, like I've been watching these buckle fractures for six months now or a year now and I've never seen one move, you get a little more comfortable like, well, I don't need to see this in a week. I can see it in two weeks, you know, that type of thing. Um, but I think in general, you, you're, you're gonna get dinged and this has happened to me of not x-raying enough versus x-raying too much. So, I mean, we have kind of an internal Kind of evaluation of each other if we have complications a lot of times the thing would be i, I would have seen this person back you know a week later two weeks and so again i think early on x-raying frequently and following things is is an important thing to do other thing to keep in mind is that pediatric fractures um have are there's good and bad things about them they have the great thing about most pediatric fractures they have a great uh, ability to remodel their bones that unfortunately we use as we uh, get old, or we lose as we get older and so you can because of that not necessarily be as aggressive and having perfect alignment and things and uh, it's surprising how how much remodeling can occur the downside of some of that is that the kids can heal really quickly too so you have a smaller window to intervene and you need to watch them much more closely because if you miss the boat and now it's been you know a couple weeks and it's a four-year-old kid with a fracture and it's already healing the surgeon usually isn't very happy because it's like, I wish I would have seen this kid a week ago so we could you know, fix this a lot, a lot easier, uh, more easily if something happens. And I think the last thing you just always need to talk about to people too, is if you have a fracture that goes into a joint, they're in all likelihood, at least some post-traumatic arthritis. Whether that post-traumatic arthritis is symptomatic for them and how significantly symptomatic, you can't predict necessarily but you can pretty reliably predict that they will have some radiographic change of arthritis in that joint in the future. And that's regardless of whether you end up even fixing it. 
So even with surgery, it's still an unfortunate consequence of the injury. Any questions on that? Yeah. How early would you expect that risk factor to come on? Like, does it probably depend at some point you know, when the initial injury occurs? But yeah. Like, say you have a four year old that has a particular fracture. At what point in that kid's life is that heart rate going to be an issue? Oh, gosh. Good question. Um, yeah. So I guess maybe I'll think of. Uh, one of the more common ones, there's a pediatric fracture called Talo fracture in kids, it's involves the distal tibia. You know, when would they have arthritic symptoms? I mean, for me, that'd be hard to predict. I probably wouldn't expect anything probably earlier than the age of 40 or somewhere around that age uh, in most situations, but I'm sure there are some pretty bad intraarticular injuries where you could see something that would occur more quickly than that. But I think it depends on the, a lot of factors, you know, weight bearing bone versus non weight bearing and, how, you know, uh, what the the patient is involved in too through their life, and how much they're loading it, stressing it. Hey, Dr. Hunt. Yeah. Can you um, repeat the question if it's asked um, in the large conference room so that everyone on Zoom can hear the question? Sure. And then um, I'll keep <laughs> track of the chat, and that way if people want to throw their questions out on chat, then I can ask you those um, so you don't have to keep track of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question from Dr. Ernstberger was that I answered was uh, how soon would you expect to see some of those arthritic symptoms develop? So that helps catch people up a bit, but I, I didn't realize I couldn't hear that there very well. So apologize for that. All right. Uh, I'll run through these. Start kind of from the bottom, work our way up. So. Uh, malleolar fractures of the ankle, very common. Things that you'll see in your office, just like ankle sprains are super common. Uh, yeah, you can, these fractures can involve the lateral medial or uh, what we call the posterior malleolus of the ankle, which is basically the backside of the tibia that where it articulates with the talus. Uh, I think the key thing with these is when you're looking at an x-ray is you want to watch for um, widening at the mortis, which is basically a, a, the space on the medial side of the talus between the talus and the medial malleolus. The other thing you want to pay attention to is overlap of the fibula. The fibula and tibia should overlap on the mortise view at least a millimeter. So if, there, if you don't see that overlap, then be concerned that you might have disruption of those ligaments there and a syndesmotic injury. Uh, on a, that's why we often, you know, we should, when you evaluate an ankle, squeeze up higher on the tibia and fibula because if, depending on the mechanism, the syndesmotic ligament sometimes pops out through the the proximal fibula and causes that uh, injury is called a mesa new fracture. So uh, those are kind of key things that you want to look at on the x-ray. Uh, this is an example of a trimalleolar fracture. So you can see injuries both on the medial and lateral malleolus. And then when you look on the, on the side view there, there's a displaced fracture also of the posterior malleolus. So this is a bad injury. This is not one that you're going to take care of. But again, kind of one of those things like if you're if you're out there doing, doing moonlighting or this happens to come into your office, so you throw that out there like, yep, I'm not taking care of this one. This needs, you know, this needs surgery because, uh, you know, that is an unstable, unstable injury. So lateral malleolus fractures are by far going to be the ones that you're likely going to hold on to uh, and take care of. Um, there's this Weber classification system um, that is, I think, the simplest to remember. There's lots of other ones if you want to go, you know, looking at this, there's, uh, more common is of injury, but you can see these labeled here. A Weber A injury is an injury where the uh, fracture is just below the level of the joint line between the tibia and the talus. A Weber B injury comes to that level of the joint line, and then the C injury is one that's above. Uh, most of these that are end up being kind of inversion type injuries to to cause the fibula to break. But but if you need if you think of the ankle as a ring. So you have bony structures and then those are connected by ligaments. If you have a break in one of the bones and also and then a ligament injury on the other side, then things can potentially be unstable. And so I think when you when you see these and they come into your office, it's really important to get us in to get the patient to tell you how did that ankle twist. For me, if it's inversion, they just have a lateral injury only, you know, the inside of their ankle is not that tender. Those mostly are going to be stable injuries and ones that I'm much more comfortable taking care of. If it's been an eversion injury, then based, you know, then that suggests that there was a twisting that would cause some injuries to the deltoid ligament 
and then all, enough force or pushing away of things that it cracked the fibula as that talus kind of rotated externally and started pushing on the tip of the fibula. So those, at least in my mind, are like, this one could be a problem. You're gonna watch it more closely at least and, and make sure that things stay stable. So does that make sense? So this one would be an example of a Weber A, B, or C for those that are here in the room. And yeah, so Weber B. And so, and then you can look at, you know, the clear space there. The, the challenge is the lateral clear space can change based look different or closer compared to the other side. So I always pay attention to the medial clear space and compare that space to the space that you measure between the tibia and the talus, uh, kind of up in this area. So here to here. Um, so I, I, you know, if you're looking at it and think, man, it looks just a little bit different, you know, again, use your measuring tool, find out. If, if it's within a millimeter, you're probably fine. You know, you'll see enough of these eventually that you're like, as soon as you throw it up, you're like, yeah, I, I think that might be one that's gonna need, that is unstable. So if you see widening of that median clear space, that's not one you're gonna to wanna to hold on to and certainly one you're gonna send on to a surgeon. So if everything, line, everything lines up fine, mortis isn't just a single-sided injury of the fibula. Uh, the initial management, actually, you know, you can use just as little as an air cast with some, especially the Weber A fractures that are really distal on the bone. Um, there are people that are comfortable enough and not that swollen with these that they can get by with that. Uh, a lot of people are just, pretty swollen, tender, don't want to bear weight. And so you put them in a walking boot, you maybe give them some crutches uh, until they can start really bearing weight bearing comfortably in the boot and then give them something for pain management, whatever you choose. Um, I usually follow up x-rays within the first couple of weeks, especially with the B and C fractures, the Weber A, you know, people are gonna tell you they're always stable. Well, there's very little medicine, it's always a never, but you know, I'd say in general Weber A's, that is the case, they tend to stay where they are. And then these little avulsion fractures, which I get sent frequently from the emergency room, they have this little fleck of bone kind of pulled off the tip of the fibula or even sometimes the tip of the medial malleolus. Those are ligamentous avulsions and just a bad ankle sprain. So you don't have to be more gradation or shutting, you know, keeping them from bearing weight. I just say, you know, yeah, you got a little bit of bony injury instead of, you know, the ligament tearing, the, it just kind of tear, pulled off where it attached on the bone, kind of treat it the same way. Medium malleolus fracture, again, this is kind of just to give you a, kind of maybe a line of demarcation of what you're going to take care of. Um, really more common to have non-union. The reason for that is they are, are they come to the, they have a connection with the joint itself. And so joint fluid tends to get pushed up between those two fragments. And as that's happening, you know, as that's happening, the bones, you know, bone can't bridge across there. And so they end up not healing. So typically the surgeons with isolated medial malleolus fractures just cinch it together, run a couple screws in there and, and take care of it and just avoid that complication. Um, so most medium malleolus fractures, I'd say you won't take care of. I've taken care of some that are just completely not in this place. It's a hairline crack, you know, no separation at all between the fracture fragments and a few of those I've taken care of, but I'm usually showing them to an orthopedic surgeon as I'm kind of following it along. If you get, if you get medium malleolus in general, if you're not taking care prefer that one on. Uh, isolated posterior malleolus fractures, Hard to see sometimes. Um, if you do see it, look for other injuries, but most of those, you know, again, are, that are non-displaced and the articular surface looks good, can kind of treat like you would the lateral malleolus fracture, uh, as long as they're not involving a large portion of the, of the articular surface. Uh, multiple malleoli, like we saw, you know, in that first picture, you know, don't take care of those, refer those on, because they're gonna need, they're gonna need surgery, so. Any questions on those before I move on to the metatarsals? Okay, so metatarsal fractures, very common. You'll see a lot of these. Uh, fifth metatarsal by far is the one you'll probably see the most of. Uh, you can, injuries tend to occur either at the neck, the shaft, or down towards the tuberosity. Uh, most of these do very well. The exception to that is the Jones fracture, which is in the fifth metatarsal, uh, and shown here, it tends to occur in that kind of first centimeter to centimeter and a half of the meta metaphysis diaphysis, approximately. Um, so those are, those are ones that are a little bit more challenging and you just need to understand some of the complications. Uh, still don't, I still feel like you can take care of some of them if you're comfortable enough and you, to discuss those complications with the patient. Uh, I would say with metatarsal fractures for sure, especially in the fifth, um, radiographic union often lags behind clinical union. So what, I'm, what do I mean by that? The patient's coming in, they're feeling better, swelling's down, they're walking on it pretty well, you know, with or without protection. You throw the x-ray up and you think, well, 
still kind of looks the same, but at least you're feeling better. So that, that oftentimes happens with these, so don't get too hung up on your x-ray changes if the patient's progressing in the right direction. So most of these metatarsal fractures, fifth, you know, even, uh, you know, middle metatarsals, like third and fourth, you can manage with just a post-op shoe. Uh, sometimes people need a little bit more support, in which case I'll use a short walking boot, so not the ones that go almost up to the knee, but they kind of come almost like about as high as a lace-up ankle. Um, and you can script these out and have people go pick them up in medical supplies places if you don't stock them in your office. You know, get them on crutches if they still can't leave very comfortably in, in one of those two things, and then do something for pain control. These tend to be pretty stable injuries. So most of the time I'm seeing them back in two to three weeks rather than weekly early on. Again, when you're first starting to take care of them, you may choose to see them weekly and that's certainly fine. Um, if they have joint involvement, so main, mainly that joint involvement I get concerned about is back towards the tarsometatarsal joint. That is you know, what we call the lis franc joint and those injuries can be a little complicated, uh, especially if you have more than one metatarsal involved. Uh, so if you see that and think, eh, that's a little bit too, you know, too close for comfort for me, you can send it on. Honestly, plantar angula angulation I rarely see, and oftentimes if, you, if they're weight bearing, that plantar angulation will correct. As they start to push put weight on it, it'll kind of push it back up into the right position. So that to me isn't quite as concerning. And to keep in mind as you're following these, especially the fifth metatarsal fracture, you're gonna be by far one of the more common fractures you'll come across. About 15% of those heal with an asymptomatic fibrous union. So you keep x-raying it, you're seeing them at six weeks, eight weeks. They come in here, they're saying it feels fine, I'm back in my regular shoes, it doesn't hurt anymore, it hurts minimally, and the x-ray continues to look the same. So don't worry about that. Those are fibrous unions. Those, again, are doing just fine. Treat the patient, don't treat the x-ray, and you know, tell them you're, you're, you know, all is good, it's just gonna look this way anytime somebody x-rays in the future. The ones you get concerned about are the ones that don't show healing, but hurt. Still having swelling, can't progress their activity, and that is you know, more looking like what would be a non-union, and we're not gonna discuss you know, that complication necessarily, but there are a few of those that end, end up that way, but it's a very, very small percentage. So just some examples of uh, fractures uh, in the metatarsal, again, kind of mainly looking at the fifth. The, uh, the one on the left there as well, post-op tolerated. Uh, the one on the right is more of a, there's a bleak kind of shaft fractures. They almost always are oblique like that, uh, and sometimes even a little bit comminuted. They look terrible uh, on an oblique view sometimes, but I've shown these to my foot and ankle surgeon, and I've never seen anybody fix one of them. Um, <clears throat> so they, they usually stay fairly well lined overall, you know, on the AP and lateral view, and those, those do well as well. Uh, th this is an example of the Jones fracture. Again, location is is key in this, when it's in that spot, uh, it's got a, it's a watershed area of blood supply. Um, it's not like none of these heal, actually still most of them do, but the complication rate of non-union is higher. And so you just need to kind of explain that to the patient. You may be a little bit more aggressive as far as keeping their weight off of it and just have to let them know that if we go non-operative treatment, there's a, there is a chance it doesn't heal and then you end up needing surgery at the end of that how they react to that, um, to that advice. So there are these, especially in athletes, because of the time frame that they just fix surgically because they don't want to deal with that complication and more lost time. Uh, you know, so there might be somebody in the working world that would be in that same boat and they say, nope, let's fix it because I don't want to deal with a complication of it not healing. So Jones fractures might be ones that if you're not seeing a lot of these, you punt to your orthopedic surgeon and let them, let them take care of it. So any questions on metatarsals? All right, so phalanx fractures in the foot. Um, these generally do well. Uh, people get pretty concerned on them, about them. You know, they run their toe into something and it gets all blue or get all purplish and discolored and, and they want, you know, want to make sure that they didn't break it. Um, I, you know, lesser toe fractures do great. Uh, great toe is kind of an exception in some situations, but even most of those actually do very well. The, the problem one is the lateral angulated small toe fracture. So you hit that toe and it gets pushed out to laterally. It's like, well, you can't leave that there because you can't put your shoes on. You're gonna keep hitting it on things. And those are gonna need a closed reduction, which just requires a pretty simple digital block and you know pulling on the toe back to get it right back in the right position. Again, something 
I think that you, you know, anybody here can learn to do and be comfortable doing. So I get people that come in if they have a lesser, you know, they've stubbed their toe. I always look at the feet side to side. If the toe looks straight compared to the other side, kind of normal, you know, same alignment. And if you looked at enough people's feet, some people's toes aren't straight anyway. They kind of go in funny directions. So it looks similar to the other side. I always tell them, yeah, it could be broken. It could be sprained, could be bruised, but unlikely you know, you're not going to do anything. You don't necessarily have to get an x-ray. Just tell them how to symptomatically treat it. You know, put them in a post-op shoe. They can buddy tape it for comfort and uh, typically do just fine. So again, just some examples, x-ray Y actually intra-articular, but it's not displaced and that's gonna do fine just with symptomatic treatment. Uh, the one in the middle there is a you know, small toe fracture that's angulated, you can't leave that. That you do a digital block and kind of get the result that's on the far right there um, where you reduced it and then you can just treat it like a non-displaced fracture at that point with uh, buddy taping. So the bottom picture is just kind of an example how you might buddy tape. I always try to put a little bit of gauze between the toes um, just to kind of soak up moisture and provide some uh, little bit more comfort because you have two kind of sweaty toes taped together all the time it doesn't feel doesn't feel great and honestly like the taping I only do sometimes people just the pressure of the tape feels worse and you know if that's the case then there's no sense in doing it um, it'll it'll heal just fine with even without the bunny taping yeah Yeah, so, so the question was, is a digital block on the toes the same as on the finger? Uh, and the answer is yes. There's basically four digital nerves, two dorsally, two, two on, the bolt, on the plantar side, and you kind of do a ring block just like you might on a finger to numb it up. Yeah, exactly the same technique. Great toe fractures oftentimes look like the picture on the top left, you know, kind of swollen, discolored toe. Uh, just a couple examples, you know, where there's re really kind of are treated symptomatically, just like a lesser toe fracture. Uh, the one on the bottom left is an oblique, probably intraarticular, but again, non-displaced. Post-op shoe is usually fine. And the one on the right is a distal phalanx fracture, again, in a pretty good near anatomic alignment. Uh, again, one you can you can take care of and follow, and, and they'll do great. <clears throat> Uh, real quickly, we'll cover just fibular shaft and head fractures. Typically, result of a direct blow. They, uh, the fibula is really vascular, so it tends to heal very well. If you ever see people that break both bones in the leg and the surgeon fix the tibia, they usually just leave the fibula wherever it ends up and let it heal in that, in that spot. Um, so, you know, small amounts of displacement or angulation aren't a big deal in the fibula. Uh, the fibula only takes about 15% of your body weight, so you don't have to keep them non-weight bearing. Uh, and this, you know, this common injury you'll see in like contact sports such as football um, or where somebody falls and kind of hits the lateral leg on the ground, um, these breaks in the fibular shaft. Treatment for these, long leg air cast, which is, a, it basically comes almost up to the knee, level of the knee. You can see there on the left boot. Again, that depends on the location, but most of the kind of mid to mid to distal, maybe a slightly proximal shaft fracture of the fibula, you can immobilize with one of those two things. The tougher one's the fibular head fracture. So this is so high that neither of these braces even come close to it. Uh, uh, you might use a knee immobilizer, which is a bit of a pain because walking around with your knee straight all the time doesn't, you know, causes its own problems. I sometimes just let people just walk on those as they can. Uh, the perineal nerve wraps around where the fibular head is and fibular neck. So make sure they can dorsiflex their ankle and don't have a foot drop, that there's no signs of injury to that nerve. Again, you can let them weight bear as tolerated. Those two in, you know, injuries of the fibula more proximally along the shaft and, and, and above are very stable injuries in general. Uh, you can x-ray at three at six weeks and kind of just see how, some, make sure symptomatically they're doing fine. Uh, pretty rare to have any of those not heal. All right, I'm going kind of slow. Okay, we'll jump, jump up to upper extremity fractures. Again, uh, we'll kind of go through these starting with the clavicle, which is again, clavicle is usually a fall and directly on the shoulder. Uh, you know, we take all clavicle fractures, regardless of location, you know, better than 90% of them are gonna heal. You know, old kind of saying in orthopedics is that the two ends of the clavicle are in the same room, it's gonna heal. So they can be pretty widely separated and actually do quite well. There's been a trend lately in the last 10, 15 years where they're fixing more clavicle fractures. Uh, I think there's still argument of which ones need fixed and when which ones don't. There are some true indications for fixing them. <clears throat> a lot of the other indications 
dimensions are relative. Um, most of the fractures are going to occur in the middle third of the bone. It's an S-shaped bone, and that's where it's a little bit flatter. 15% occur out in the distal third. Uh, they do often displace, and that's because the pull of the sternocleidomastoid muscle that attaches on the top of the clavicle right there on the proximal fragment. Um, again, in general, they do quite well. <clears throat> Smokers might be a little bit of an exception. So just some pictures of clavicle fractures, common patterns that you'll see top left is this, you know, slightly comminuted fracture with a little butterfly tilts between the two pieces. That thing actually provides a scaffold for the bones to kind of go across to mend the two pieces back together. Uh, the center one is kind of shortened and overlapped. Uh, again, probably separated between the two fracture fragments by maybe a centimeter or so. And then the far right one is more of just a distal uh, injury out near the acromion. Um, so all those actually you can treat non-surgically and the majority will do just fine, even though they look kind of, you know, kind of crazy. It's like, well, how does that middle one even heal? Yeah, surprisingly it can. So most of these you're gonna be, you can discuss the possibility of fixing it if they, somebody doesn't like the cosmetic appearance of things because they will have a bump in that area forever. Um, but if they are okay with non-surgical treatment, put them in a sling, figure of eight brace. Studies suggest most patients prefer the sling and find it more comfortable and than, than the figure of eight brace. They can start to move the arm and arrange this, you know, that, that whatever pain allows. I typically follow up x-rays at around three weeks and again at six, you know, somewhere in that three to four, six to eight week range is fine. Most of these are gonna heal in eight weeks or less. Week range. Uh, with one of these, I tend to keep them out of any kind of collision sport or contact sport for about eight weeks, and that's kind of uh, expert opinion more so than based on any kind of you know randomized study or anything. Uh, just by then, you have a good enough strength to that union that you know taking a lot of hits to the area is going to be okay. Um, when do you refer? I would say maybe in distal third fractures, just because of the higher incidence of non union. Uh, that's a maybe. I honestly hold on to most of those and they do fine. And the non-unions that I've seen, most of them are asymptomatic. So they, they, they do okay with them. Um, if you have a high level athlete or, you know, contact sport athlete that doesn't want, you know, doesn't want the shortening, doesn't want the bony prominence, you know, especially if football players can be running their shoulders into, into people. Sometimes they want the fixation. It does get them a lot of times back to activity a little more quickly. So that might be one you might consider referring. Um, again, somebody doesn't want the cosmetic bump that ends up there. But they don't find that tolerable. You can send it on. Uh, if the skin is tinted, so the tinting of the skin, especially if it looks like it's not going to, that skin blood supply is somehow being compromised or it's starting to get a little bit, you, know, you think it might get necrotic, that is definitely one you're going to send, send along. You know, this kind of shard or point of the like part of the fragment that's pushing up to the, through the skin. Or to the skin, um, and then separation between the fragments of more than two two centimeters or more, kind of a relative indication to fix it. Those, you know, in, in surgeons' opinions, are ones that maybe won't do as well, and so that they may end up with the problem later on down the road. Uh, pictures just a couple of techniques people use to fix uh, clavicles that run a rod down it, or uh, a lot of times they have this like long plate with multiple screws. So. And there's hardware issues, unfortunately. You know, people can have, just by fixing it, have issues with the hardware. So, any questions on clavicle fractures? So, definitely one I think, you know, majority of the time, a primary care physician can take care of it. Uh, radial head and neck fractures, another one that's pretty simple to take care of. Typically, a fallen outstretched hand uh, can be a direct blow kind of landing on the shoulder. Uh, on exam, they're going to have an effusion, typically loss of motion, can't straighten it, can't bend it all the way. <clears throat> and they have pain over the radial head and usually pain with, you know, when they try to supinate more so than pronate. Radiographically, things you're going to see uh, on the left, you see kind of a intraarticular fracture of the lateral aspect of the radial head. You know, in that instance, it's actually depressed a couple millimeters. You can see a little bit of a step off at the joint surface. And the other thing sometimes you can see is it's very difficult to see the fracture line, but you see the fat pad sign uh, on your lateral view. So arrows are pointing to the <clears throat> anterior fat pad which is kind of pushed out like a sail. It's like a triangle sticking out. It's seen, but it looks more like the fat pad on this view where it's kind of just laying against the bone. In a normal situation, you should never see the posterior fat pad. So if you see that thing sticking out at all, <clears throat> then you know you have an effusion, hemarthrosis, there's some fluid in the elbow causing uh, that to be seen. So there's other reasons than a fracture that you can have swelling in the elbow. It happens with a sprain, happens with a contusion. You know, 
doesn't always have to mean that there's a fracture, but you know, in the right setting, history, exam, if you're clinically suspicious, treat it like there's a fracture there you can't see and, and, and then make sure you're following up and, and repeating an x-ray. Okay, just a couple examples. This is a you know, radial neck fracture. Uh, these tend to do a little bit better than the head because they're extra articular injuries. Again, they're very stable and tend to do uh, quite well uh, treatment for both of these. <clears throat> and again, probably the you know, neck fractures are typically not a big deal, do, do great, stay in, stay in right position or stable. Intraarticular fractures that don't have any uh, again kind of treat the same way. Sling for comfort. Uh, if they're really, really uncomfortable, like this sling isn't doing anything for me, I'm still, in, you know, I still need to feel like I need more support. You can put them in a long arm posterior splint for the first week. Uh, I try to encourage them to get out of it after that week just because the elbow can tend to get pretty stiff. Uh, you can allow them to progress their motion as their pain allows and wean from the sling as their pain allows. So it's kind of symptomatic. As their pain gets better, they can use the arm more. I get follow-up x-rays usually at two weeks and then again at six weeks with the neck. With the intraarticular injuries that are non-displaced, you might x-ray a little more frequently uh, just to make sure that piece isn't moving at all. Um, again, if you get more than a couple millimeters of separation or depression at the joint surface, then that's probably one you might want to send along, at least get an opinion from a surgeon. <laughs> Questions on that? Okay. Distal radius fracture, typically a fallen outstretched hand. Uh, there's two ways you can fall out. And your wrist is extended, or you can hold up underneath you. Uh, those cause kind of just different fracture patterns based on the force across the bone. Um, if you have the radius and the ulna involved in an injury, then it's potentially more unstable than just, just the radius by itself. Um, Fractures that are intraarticular at the radius are also more potentially unstable. There's lots of eponyms attached to radius fractures. You've probably heard these, but Collie's, Smith fractures, Bart, Barton's fractures, chauffeurs, um, and then the kids, there's the torus and, and buckle fractures that you have. <clears throat> All right, there we go. So this is a, <clears throat> this is a comminuted intraarticular fracture of the radius. There's probably a little bony injury at the tip of the ulnar styloid. Um, but you can see too how short the radius looks in comparison to the ulna, even though there's a red circle kind of, <laughs> kind of blocking that out. But uh, anyway, but in that situation, you see how much overhang there is on the edges. You, you know that thing has been pushed down on itself. That is a fracture you don't want to take care of. That's one you're going to send to the surgeon and be fixed because uh, of the amount of displacement and comminution that you have there. Just a couple pictures so you know what you're dealing with, but somebody mentions these terms. A Barton fracture involves the volar aspect of the radius. Uh, those are bad actors. You see that, you don't want to take care of that one either, even if it's not displaced, because those tend to slip off. Uh, just because of the pull of the tendons, the volar fragment will just slide down, you know, see it, and then a week later when you re-x-ray, it's, it's fallen off. So if you get a Barton's fracture, send it on, even if it looks pretty good from the get-go. Uh, Collie's fracture is these fractures of the radius that dorsally angulate, or the distal fragment dorsally angulates. It's minimal amount of angulation, some, some of those you might take care of, uh, but a lot of those can end up being unstable too, just because of um, the amount of comminution that happens on the, on the cortex of the bone dorsally. A chauffeur's fracture is a, just involves the radial styloid. Uh, those are honestly most of the time pretty stable and ones you can take care of and you only really see it on that AP view. Uh, but those that are non-displaced, again, ones you can take care of. And the buckle or torse fracture, super common fracture you'll see in kids. Uh, and even with a little bit of dorsal angulation or even some volar angulation, especially on the age of the kid that has pretty wide open fices, those will remodel and uh, really do quite well. <clears throat> so probably key things you're going to look at is just angulation, shortening of the bone, or uh, volar tilt of the radius, normal lateral view of the radius. The articular surface is going to point in a volar direction about 12 degrees. So if you've lost that or even angulated five degrees dorsally, you've lost, you know, almost 20 degrees of angulation just in that. So uh, if you're questioning kind of which bones normally longer in this patient, you can always get a comparison view to check their uh, ulnar variance. So is their ulna longer, shorter, equal to their radius in, a, in, a normal, in their normal side? I would say if you have in children and elderly, less than five to 10 degrees of angulation, you're probably fine to take care of it. If it's uh, kind of an adult, especially kind of middle-aged adult, 
you pretty much want things pretty close to anatomic position. So if you have any amount of dorsal annulation, um, those things can kind of settle and angulate more. And most of the time I'm kind of referring those on to the surgeon just to get, uh, get things put in the right place. So if you have these not, you, you know, are comfortable taking care of, you typically put them in a sugar tongue splint initially because of the swelling, and then you can transition to uh, a cast after the first week, you x-ray weekly for the first couple weeks, and then, a, you know, around four and six weeks. Uh, some people go long arm uh, with, with a radius fracture. I would say in general, I'm using a short arm. Uh, again, reasons not not to take care of it, move it on. Um, articular separation, if they have step off at the articular surface, if there's significant shortening or angulation or displacement, send it on. So I think in general, you're likely going to be, be taking care of these non-displaced fractures of the, rate of the distal radius. Um, the elderly population's a little bit tricky because they can, you know, a lot of times you're not, they don't want surgery or they, they're not more aggressive surgically, but some really some more recent studies have shown that open reduction and internal fixation tend to do better as far as patients satisfaction and function compared to letting some of these, let, letting elderly people deal with a malunion where it's not quite perfect. Uh, surgery probably actually. Scaphoid fractures, carpal bone, the second most common is the triclectrum. It's one of the more commonly missed fractures in orthopedics and primary care, really anywhere, because <clears throat> it's, it's a challenging bone sometimes to see the break. You know, the thing that makes you clinically concerned is tenderness in the anatomic snuff box. Uh, typical treatment, if you're suspicious, put them in a thumb spike, a cast or splint. Uh, and then, you know, if you know for sure you're dealing with it, they're going to be in that for anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. If you're questioning whether it is, you're going to need to see them back. You can get a scaphoid view if the standard wrist x-rays haven't shown the fracture. Um, your x-ray frequency, once you've made the diagnosis, usually you know, every other week is about kind of how often I do it, up to about four weeks, and then I'm waiting until closer to that eight-week time <clears throat> for kind of removing the cast and finally seeing things. In those cases where you just can't see it on an x-ray, but you're pretty suspicious they have it, uh, MRI is kind of the gold standard uh, kind of advanced imaging to get to make the diagnosis. CT scan is sometimes used to confirm healing because sometimes it can be very hard to say for sure it's, it's healed. I think you do it. If clinically things look fine, you're okay to not get it. But if it's one of those or you think it should be healed, but you're not quite sure on the x-ray, CT, CT scan can be helpful. So the tough thing with the scaphoid, it's a single artery blood supply, and that blood supply is a retrograde off the radial artery. So it starts distally and comes proximally. So the distal third do well because they have good supply there. Middle third mostly do well, but a few might, might not heal. The proximal one-third of the are the problem childs in the scaphoid. Uh, just because of non-union and avascular necrosis of the proximal fragment. So scaphoid fracture, which ones might you take care of? I would say the ones that are completely non-displaced. Either you can't see the, the fracture line, it's only picked up on MRI, <clears throat> or the fracture line's a hairline crack that's not, you can't see any gap at all. Our hand surgeon, basically, if he sees, if it's, if it's a millimeter, if he can see that, he considers that displaced, and it's usually pretty aggressive, you know, surgically fixing them. Um, and definitely any proximal third fracture, I think even non-displaced ones, you probably don't want to hang on to. And you, and in an athlete, again, kind of the same situation, you don't want the complication of a non-union, you know, especially on those waist fractures, you might just go ahead and send it on to the surgeon just, in, so, just so they can be informed and make a decision with how they want to fix it. Um, I'm getting close on time. I'll finish up after metacarpal fractures, although I have a few more. Um, Metacarpal fracture, typically a direct blow. Uh, again, super common injury you're gonna see, especially if you have uh, people in your, in your practice that tend to wanna punch things when they get angry. Uh, I got a lot of those that come through my office. <clears throat> um, most of these fractures will occur around the neck uh, and you can accept quite a bit of angulation in the neck, especially in the fifth metacarpal up to 40 degrees. I've even seen some, my surgical partners accept more. Um, if you're thinking about the, how much angulation can I, neck angulation can I accept? If you're going from the second over to the fifth, it basically starts at 10 degrees in the second, 20 in the third, 30 in the fourth, and 40 in the fifth. So that's, those are kind of you know, ballpark numbers you can kind of keep in your mind as far as how much angulation you might accept before you know, moving or surgery. As you move down that bone into the shaft, you really can't accept as much angulation because if you think about the fragment, how much, you know, as that lever arm increases where the break is, the amount that that 
metacarpal head is moving in a pulmonary direction increases. That, that, does that make sense? You have a bigger kind of part of it shifting forward the further down the bone you go. When you're trying to figure out how much is it angulated, the oblique view always looks bad. So make sure you just get a good lateral, a true lateral of that to, to measure your angulation because an oblique can exaggerate things. Um, Non-operative treatment of metacarpal fractures, if they're non-displaced, have acceptable amount of angulation. When they flex the fingers, the fingers don't rotate over each other and they're you know, not into the joint surface. And also I would say probably in general, don't if you have multiple metacarpals involved, probably won't be one you wanna hang, hang on to but if it's just an isolated fifth or fourth metacarpal, those are ones you can take care of, you know, minimally angulated, non-displaced, uh, place them in an ulnar gutter splint um, for the fourth and fifth. And if it's the third metacarpal, you have to use kind of what's called a top and the bottom of the hand to kind of hold things still. You want to present about and some flexion at the MCP joints to put the ligaments on stretch. Just a picture of a ulnar gutter cast. You know, if you don't trust the patient to leave it on, that's a good good option. You can also, also just use a splint that's removable. If there's, again, excessive angulation, more so than the cutoffs that you're using, if the finger is malrotated, multiple metacarpals involved, if it's intraarticular, especially at the base of the metacarpal, or if it's one of these transverse kind of displaced fractures of the shaft, those are ones you're going to move along. So far left is kind of an example of the transverse displaced shaft fracture. Those tend to be unstable. You can reduce them, but they just keep wanting, they keep wanting to move. Middle picture is actually what's called a uh, Rolando fracture. It's a fracture at the base of the first metacarpal. Any intraarticular first metacarpal base fracture probably it typically needs surgery. And then the la last picture there on the right, it's just a multiple metacarpal uh, injury that you probably wouldn't want to hold on to. So again, one metacarpal, not rotated, minimal angulation, those things you can treat with a, with a splint and, and follow along. So I'm going to stop on a few more slides, but I have today, I guess. So, <laughs> so hopefully that's helpful, guys. Um, I'm going to go to my conclusion real quickly, so I'll just talk over those. But, you know, again, fracture care is something you guys can do. Uh, make sure you know your terminology. As, as anything, especially when you have a broad scope of practice, know your limits. So know where you're I'm, – I'm not – taking care of this one, this one moving on, this is one I can hang on to. And you'll, you'll be able to do that the more experience that you get. You know, wherever you end up practicing, you can get somebody that you can run some of these things by. You know, a lot of times they appreciate it too because they don't want to see things that aren't surgical. If you can take care of it, that's helpful to, helpful to the surgeon and, and his workload as well. Um, practice reading your own x-rays while you're here. Don't just trust the radiology report. I've had many examples over the years where the radiologist sees one thing, I see something completely different and they miss something. They're human too. So look at the look at the films yourself. I think it's a that's an important skill to develop. Uh, again, keep in mind your window to intervene in kids is shorter. Make sure you're getting appropriate follow-up radiographs, and uh, yeah, make sure you're following things closely so you avoid complications. All right, thanks, guys. <clears throat>
this if it matters what the angulation inside shouldn't be angulated to the side. Yeah, I mean, if you're seeing angulation on, the, on your AP view, that's likely going to result in malrotation or a crooked looking finger. So if you see, that's rare to see. Yeah. It can, but it's, it's not that common. Um, yeah, if you see angulation in that plane, that's probably one's going to need to be fixed. But most of these angulate and kind of what you're going to see on the lateral view. Um, so I, I guess more of that's technically that's coronal plane, I guess. But um, so that that's the that's the view you're going to want to measure it on. So the 10, 20, 30, 40 applies to this, like the Palmer. Right. Yeah, and really these don't tend to dorsally angulate. They always angulate a Palmer direction. I think that's it. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Sure. You Thank you. I, I don't know how to, I guess I would disconnect here. I got it. I got it. <laughs> no, I got it. All right. <laughs>